come down a little bit more. In the South China Sea, far from land, former Norwegian Navy diver Paul Dinesen and his colleagues are anchoring a floating oil platform to the seabed. The consequences of making a mistake are, are, are drastic. In a joint venture between Shell and Petronas, it will tap into 19 deep water wells with a production capacity of 135,000 barrels of oil each day. Right now, the platform is hooked up to three mooring lines and held in position by huge tugs. But until a fourth line is attached, the platform is vulnerable to storms. When that fourth line is on, the platform is actually storm safe. Everybody relaxes a bit. From construction vessel the Sapporo 3000, Powell's team will use remotely operated vehicles or ROVs to find the fourth mooring line on the seafloor. They'll haul it to the surface with heavy duty cranes. Hey, you want to grab it and give it a shot? It's Paul's job to ensure the operation runs smoothly. I'm a coordinator, you might say. Four meters aft and four meters outboard of the ship. Cheers, bro. Before Paul dispatches an ROV, Are you happy with your cameras? Supervisor Kim Lendrum tests its high tech robotics. Roger thrusters, retracting the rig master, opening the jaws. That's good, closing the jaws. Roger. This um, T4 arm we've named the beast because it is so powerful and it does so many wonderful things for us down below. At a cost of six million US dollars, the ROV can withstand extreme conditions. Well, these ROVs are depth rated to 3,000 meters. So there's some pressure there as well as uh, very low temperatures and that's what they like. They always say that a happy ROV is a wet ROV. The ROV begins a descent that will take 22 minutes. The seabed is 1,200 meters deep. Before it was just mind-bogglingly out of our reach. And of course the engineering and the technical competency is getting better and better. So we're actually managing to go to those places we never could before. The mooring line that they're looking for has been lying on the seabed for two years. Kim takes up the ROV controls while Paul directs from the bridge. Slow down to uh, 0.15. You see the boy? Got a digital there, Paul? Negative. Uh, two meters left. I can see nothing. When the ROVs are thrusting around down there, you, you kick up a lot of uh, the seabed and, and that obviously disturbs your visibility, which makes it a little bit more of a challenge trying to hook things up and locate their positions. Kim gets the ROV to hover mid-sea while they wait for the silt to clear. You can't really see, you know, and the ship supervisor wants everything done as soon as... We've only got about, what, 45 minutes or something. He's just got to wait for us to get our visibility and then we can move and do things properly. Kim searches for a buoy that marks the end of the two-kilometer line. Is that one coming into view there? Yeah, I think I see the chain there, Paul. The mooring line looms into view. What we do is we go down with a crane with a spreader bar on, and we hook into a link here and a link here. Then we take up and hold the link like this from the end, and then we come down with our special built hook that comes in underneath, and then we link up this, and then it's hanging here. Then we take the crane up. A crane lowers the hook that will winch the line to the surface. All stop. All stop. There's a communication problem with the ROV. They just lost total communication. I mean, they lost electronics, power, cameras, feeds, everything, things. The whole operation grinds to a halt. Until the problem is fixed, nothing can happen. The only thing to do is to bring the ROV up and fix it. 
In an operation this big, a delay becomes costly. They say 500 or maybe $1,000 a minute, I'm not sure, but it's 24-7. It's a lot of money. We just lost telemetry, lost power on it. So uh, it, it turned out to be the SIM module. They replace a cable they think caused the problem. We can do a telemetry test, uh, fire it up. They check to see whether the repair has okay. worked. Function testing the uh, T4. She's alive. After an hour's delay, Paul gets his underwater eyes back and begins the complex business of hooking onto the mooring line below. Okay, just for info, that's us picking up the line. Paul uses the position of the boat. Stop at uh, two meters, please. Two meters, sir. The cranes. Come down one meter on the crane, easy, easy. And the ROVs to conduct this millimetre perfect operation over a kilometre under the surface. OK, Rudy, come up four metres. Four metres. There's actually a time delay because of the water depth, so when you do move, it's uh, a couple of minutes later, the things move on the seabed. Hey, Rudy, pay in a bit faster. Paul tries to manoeuvre the giant hook under the chain, but there's a hitch. I think it's wrong. It has to be rotated 180. Yeah, currently the hook is 180 degrees out. So we have to reorientate it. And then when everything's lined up, they'll come up on the, on the wire and the hook will land in its position on the specific length that it has to be on. Down, 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 down. Stop, ready? Keep going to your left there, please. Uh, four, little bit left. That's good. Keep coming out. Keep coming up, Rudy. Keep coming up. Keep coming up. Keep coming up. Stop. Okay, we got it. Brilliant. Well done. There we go. She's all yours. Chop, chop. There we go. We can see it coming up. The 150 ton mooring line takes two hours to reach the surface. Each link weighs 160 kilos. The crew temporarily stow it on the Sephora. They need to join it to a short chain that's attached to the platform. But while they transfer the platform's chain onto the Sephora, the two vessels will have to work very close together. You have to actually go up to 10 to 15 meters away when we transfer. And she is moving, and we'll be moving, and our cranes are moving, and the wires are moving. So that's quite tricky and uh, quite exciting. As the platform's chain is lowered onto the Sephora, the operation enters its most dangerous phase. The chain temporarily connects the two vessels, and while it does, Paul must ensure the vessels don't drift apart. On the bridge, can you come uh, three meters starboard, please? Oh, yeah, three meters starboard. Oh, yeah. The crew race to join the platform's chain to the mooring line. If they move, which they are, we have to try and follow them. If we don't follow them, of course the tension will come so strong, it'll rip the platform off. And then it could be very serious. Paul manages to maintain the correct position and the crew finish joining the chains. Oh, that was brilliant. What a life. Ah, what a team. As dawn breaks, the Sephora releases the fourth mooring line. It's now attached to the platform. Though there's more work to do before the platform will see first oil, she is storm safe. 